Well, on this Sunday, we have got a very special round table for you today. Two of South Florida's best journalists and opinion leaders are with us to look back at 2020 and look forward to 2021. Nancy Ancrum is there. There she is, top of your screen on the left, editorial page editor of the Miami Herald. And there below is uh, our friend Rosemary O'Hara, editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel. Ladies, good morning or good afternoon. Great to have you with us. Happy New Year. Well, happy, happy New Year to you both. Uh, we're going to look back, as I said, at some of the key events of 2020, and there's no question, Nancy and Rosemary, the big story of the year is COVID-19. Changed the way we work, the way we worship, the way we amuse ourselves, you know, and underscored some of the disparities uh, in American life between haves and have-nots. I mean, uh, Rosemary, there just hasn't ever been a year like this in our lifetime. No, I was just thinking back to the last time that I was in the studio on the round table yeah. and what a big deal it was for us to bump elbows and how long it's been and, and you know, how, how our lives have so changed, hunkered down um, in, a, in, in a way that, that nothing has ever happened like this to us in our lifetimes. And yet we're fortunate enough to be still talking to one another, being healthy when so many of our neighbors and friends and family are, um, you know, some of them are not here anymore, sadly, and too many of them are infected. And it's just so discouraging to know that our country has the worst rate of COVID in the world by far. It has been so mishandled at, you know, at every step of the way. But, you know, we did end the year on a positive note with the, with the arrival of uh, these vaccines. Now let's just hope that people can quickly and orderly get that shot in the arm. Right. Uh, Nancy Ancrum, you had, I thought, an excellent editorial Friday in the Herald where you said at the end of this awful year, uh, we, it's a bittersweet time, but we can reassess, we can begin again, we can... Be hopeful. Um, it's hard, but we can, can't we? Absolutely. Um, you know, Rosemary is right. There, you know, I would say the majority of us made it. We made it through the end of the year. Uh, we it was a slog for so many, and it was a major slog for people who were charged with keeping our lives going. Whether it was from delivering groceries or your Amazon packages. Um, drivers, grocery checkouts, essential workers, and of course, our first line healthcare workers and first responders. And yes, the vaccine does bring so much hope. However, however, the rollout, not just in this state, but across the country, has just added insult to the significant injury yeah. that's been done by its being mishandled. Once again, responsibility for distributing um, the vaccination and the, the vaccine and getting people actually vaccinated falls to the locals yep. here and across the country. And of course, every municipality, every county has different rules. So it, it, uh, no one should be shocked, but it is a surprise that our state government has not learned or does not want to learn yeah. from the mishandling of the original crisis. Yeah, Rosemary, weigh in on that because uh, we know today that uh, the state of Florida has received about 1.2 million doses of vaccine and 250,000 people have been vaccinated in the course of three weeks. I mean, that's really a pathetic kind of showing a, a pathetic response, isn't it? You know, to, yes, to Nancy's point, you know, the it comes down to health departments to um, administer this vaccine to the general population 65 plus. And Florida has starved its county health departments for years. Um, and now for the most important um, D-Day of our generation, you know, we're leaving it to this underfunded, undermanned, undertrained um, organization. 
The other, the other people that need to be called out here, though, too, are CVS and Walgreens, which are supposed to be organizing the delivery of vaccines in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And just today, I'm hearing from uh, family members of, in some of these homes where the virus is still running rampant. They still don't, so while the, the general population over 65 can now hopefully sign up to get the, the vaccine, in some of these long-term care centers, they still don't know when their loved one will be able to get vaccine, even as the virus continues its march. So I think CVS and Walgreens needs to come out and say, when are you going to vaccinate these, these vulnerable people in older home centers? And also state government needs to tell us too, why are we vaccinating 65 plus before we finish vaccinating the people in long-term care centers? Right. You know, on Tuesday of this week, we saw something I, I was just unbelievable. Over in Fort Myers on the other side of the state in Lee County, there were hundreds of seniors who spent the night sitting outside lawn chairs and under blankets um, waiting to get a shot because the Lee County Health Department said, well, we'll start giving uh, vaccine uh, vaccinations uh, tomorrow, first come, first serve. I mean, good Lord, what what is going on in a state where elderly people are spending the night uh, waiting to get something? I mean, this is just not the way to roll out a vaccination program. Absolutely. And, you know, this is the, this, I think, if we want to look at it from the top down, this is the result of President Trump's administration dismantling the, the pandemic fa uh, task force, ripping up the 68 page, um, uh, you know, specific plan on how to handle just such a scourge as the coronavirus and winging it yeah. and rejecting science. And that, that lack of respect for planning, uh, the lack of organization has just rolled downhill to affect all of the locals, all of the local municipalities that are, again, doing it their own way and not necessarily right. doing it the best way. Yeah, well, we both know, and in fact, uh, your pages, your newspapers have both editorialized about this, uh, South Florida mayors and the biggest cities Broward County, Miami Beach, uh, City of Miami, Hialeah, and elsewhere uh, have all asked the governor be, after he issued an executive order September 25th saying that they could not collect fines. They really couldn't enforce any of their tougher restrictions. But Rosemary, the, the governor just isn't budging. You know, he is saying, no, we're not going to shut down. You can't collect fines. And the result is what we saw over the last couple of days is thousands of people going out and partying close to each other. They're not wearing masks. They're not taking any precautions. There are 12 governors in this country ha who have refused to um, issue a statewide mask ordinance or requirements that you socially distance when you're in public. But only one governor, had, including Governor DeSantis, and he stands alone and he's the only governor in the country who refuses to let cities and counties enforce local mask orders. So at a time when he is saying the state knows best and, you know, the economy is more important than trying to prevent the transmission of this virus. So the state is going to tell locals how they can, um, what they cannot do. At the same time, he's sending it down to the locals to figure out how to uh, send do this vaccination. If he does, if he thinks Tallahassee knows best, then he owns the the terrible rollout of this vaccination program. And yes, he owns the surge because in as people go out um, and they think, well, the government's not saying I can't do this. Uh, they're not slapping my hand or finding me and businesses are allowed to pack people in. Um, 
you know, he, it's, it, 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 Nancy's right. It starts at the top it, in the lack of organization from the federal government and then at the state government. All we've heard from him is no. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. What we have yet to hear is what are you going to do to try to stop the spread of this deadly virus? Yeah, well, for the record, let me just say, we here on this program have tried for months to get Governor DeSantis to come on and certainly to get an answer to that question. He doesn't want to talk to us very much or uh, other people in the media. Rosemary and Nancy, hold on. Everybody stay in your place. We'll be back. More Roundtable in just a minute. Welcome back. We are in the midst of a really interesting roundtable with two old friends and two of the best journalists I know, Nancy Ancrum, the Miami Herald, Rosemary O'Hara of the Sun Sentinel. Uh, well, we, I think the political event uh, of the last year clearly was the election of Joe Biden uh, to be president, and he will be sworn in January 20th. But um, uh, Nancy, here on, um, uh, on Wednesday when Congress meets, You've got a group of maybe a dozen or so senators who are going to object to accepting the results of the Electoral College. Is this just for show? Because, you know, they're not going to win. Joe Biden is going to get 306 electoral votes. Donald Trump, 232. Biden is the winner no matter what the president says. Exactly, exactly. This is for show, but it is such a dangerous and perilous show. Uh, to the point where, I think, was it just today, maybe yesterday, there were Trump supporters outside of Marco Rubio's yes. house demanding, demanding that he join this group of anti-democracy renegades. Yes, this is for show. This is going to hold the process up and it is going to end with Joe Biden being inaugurated on January 20th. But it is a great way to score points for, uh, 28, for uh, 2022, for 2024. Uh, and I think we even see that happening here in Florida when we have, again, a governor who is um, continuing to pander to the people he will be counting on for support should he run for uh, president in 2024. Yeah. Well, Rosemary, as you well know, we have a whole group of people in Florida who are thinking about possibly running for president in 24. Marco Rubio, Rick Scott, uh, Governor DeSantis, Matt Gates. Good Lord, the list goes on and on. Um, but, you know, the, the serious thing that Nancy raises about this, whatever they're going to do on Wednesday, is that it undermines the legitimacy of an election and it throws a monkey reach, a wrench into the peaceful transfer of power, which is a fundamental building block of American democracy. You know, it's a sad day for the grand old party it, um, that had a noble beginning in fighting slavery and today has become the party of Trump. It's Trump, it's, it's these um, members who are going to challenge the results you know, called themselves members of the party of Trump. And uh, it, is a, it is dangerous that for a peaceful um, turnover, and, but it also shows that we have got to do something about the electoral college, yeah. this yeah. antiquated system that doesn't let the popular vote win. And I understand that people in the rural areas don't want the people in the cities to, you know, uh, have more influence than they do. But it is, we should have one citizen, one vote for Americans. And if, if I mean, I think the answer coming out of this is we have got to do something about the Electoral College so that the, the, that the results of the voters cannot be thrown out and elections overturned as these renegade, anti-democracy, Republican, Trumpism yeah. lawmakers in Congress are seeking to do. Right. Uh, I want to move on because a lot of, some, there were some things, some moments in 2020 that gave me real 
hope made me feel good about the future of the country. One of them, frankly, even though I wasn't crazy about her as a presidential candidate, I really very excited that Kamala Harris uh, is the vice president, uh, that she was chosen. I think in retrospect, it's been a very good choice. And uh, I think, uh, Nancy, having a, a black woman, an Asian woman, American woman, uh, as vice president of the United States, what a moment. I mean, this is... And exactly, and a heartbeat away, um, you know, from the presidency, as all vice presidents are. Uh, yes, and I think that the support she received, of course, from, you know, her sorority sisters writ large in terms of black women who came out to support her, but also she spoke uh, very, very uh, uh, movingly to, you know, uh, others who are part of her roots, and in, including yeah. um, uh, Asian Asian communities in this country. It right. really is a groundbreaking and glass ceiling breaking turn right. of events. Right. And uh, even though it's not your county, Rosemary, but I happen to, you know, think it's a great moment that Daniela Levine Cava was elected as the mayor of Miami-Dade, the first time a woman has been a mayor of this great county. And she's, I think, doing a solid job so far. Well, even up here across the Great Wall of uh, Broward, we were excited to see her win that election too, because we know her to be, you know, a principled um, county leader. She's a she's a voice on climate change, um, which and transportation and regionalism. Yeah. Um, so, Rosemary, so I was excited to see her too. Yeah, Rosemary, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you and Nancy off. We are out of time. Love talking with you. Thank you for your time this morning. Happy New Year.